Welcome to the Thrive TV Show with Lauren Parsons, helping you boost your health, energy, and productivity. Hi there, and welcome to another episode of the Thrive TV Show. I'm Lauren Parsons, your host, and today I'm joined by Dr. Gary Crotez, all the way from the UK. Hi, Gary. Hi, Lauren. How are you? I am doing really well. Better now for being able to chat to you. So today we're talking about the idea mindset, your route to a deeply fulfilling working life. So we're going to talk a bit about how to identify your strengths and understand how they can be harnessed for a genuinely fulfilling career, how to design a working life that enables you to reach your fullest potential and excites you every day, and also how to build the resilience you need to keep going when you meet challenges and obstacles. So before we get into that, Gary, can I just ask you my this and that questions? You can, you can. Okay. So tell me, cats or dogs? Dogs, very much dogs. Yes, I thought that would be it. Uh, yeah, we have two front. fluffy Pomeranians. Yes. Uh, beachfront or mountaintop? Ooh, um, beachfront because I don't like heights. Okay, nice. Spots or stripes? Mm, stripes, I think. Okay. Chocolate or cake? Chocolate. Okay. Would you rather be able to speak 10 different languages fluently or play 10 different musical instruments beautifully? Uh, I think I, languages, actually. I think I'd like to speak more languages. Okay, nice. Would you rather be able to fly or turn invisible? Turn invisible, that's very useful. Okay, oh, nice. And I don't like heights. Back to heights. <laughs> Back to the heights again. Okay, and last one. Singing or dancing? Dancing, very much dancing, professional yeah. dancing. I thought that. So Dr. Car uh, Dr. Gary Crotez, PhD, is something of an expert in career change, having trained as a doctor, worked in science, strategy consulting, and senior corporate leadership, and also traveled the world as a professional ballroom dancer. These days, he's an executive and mindset coach and has coached clients in over 15 countries, specializing in activating their unique talents and strengths to achieve ambitious personal and professional goals. The idea mindset is his tried and tested blueprint for designing your dream career, developed from what Gary learned on his own fascinating journey to career fulfillment. He lives in the UK with his wife, Mildred, and their fluffy dogs, Mochi and Bean Sprout. So, so lovely to have you here, Gary. So can you start by telling us a bit about how did you get into what it is that you're doing now? So what I what I do today is is executive coaching, career coaching, mindset coaching, um, and working with the book and 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 with the, now with the podcast where I'm interviewing people who've gone through their own, through their own career journeys. And it comes from my own path that I've been on. So I trained as a doctor, trained as a medical doctor, went to medical school for eight years. Uh, was all the way through qualified. And then realized in my late twenties that I didn't actually want to practice as a doctor. So yeah. I changed career at that point and went into business. And I spent about 17 years in the business world, um, in consulting work, in corporate leadership, in retail. Um, and at the same time, I had a sort of secret double life as a professional ballroom dancer with my wife. So we had this sort of portfolio career going on for a long period of time. And then in the middle of the pandemic, I came to the end of a particular role in retail and I thought, do I want to go for another big retail job or do I want to do the thing that I really love, which is working with people, mentoring and coaching and those kinds of things. So I decided then to step out from the corporate world, go and do my formal coaching training and set up the business that I run today. Um, mm. So that's, that's the path. Amazing. And um, just because I'm so interested, can you tell me highlight of your uh, dancing career with your wife? Can you just share something a bit about that? Cause I'm so interested. So we, in the, we we decided to go we, we were working and living and working in the uk but we started traveling the world and we were traveling out to italy every month to train with a with a um sort of elite training school in italy and it's the equivalent of you know if you're a distance runner going to kenya and running with the kenyan runners where they're all much much better than you will ever be but it mm -hmm. sort of pulls you along with them but i remember we did a particular competition in moscow and we traveled out to do the world championships uh, in Moscow. And that was this incredible experience. And I just remember, you know, walking with my wife behind the England flag in the parade of athletes. Um, and we just felt like we'd made it like, 
you know, we were never going to win the world championships, but all the effort of all the years, all the nights of pain and sweat and struggle in the studio had kind of culminated in, in that moment. And, and that was a real sort of memory for, for us that I still hold on to today. Oh, that's beautiful. That gives me shivers. I can only picture that. So let's talk about the idea mindset today. What is it that you do around helping people discover their strengths? Can you start by telling me a bit about that? So, so the, the idea in idea mindset is an acronym and it stands for identity, direction, engagement, and authenticity. And really that's a way of saying discovering who you are, your identity and where you're going, your direction for a future that you love, I, you're, you know, you've got your engagement and that it connects deeply with your values and your purpose. That's the authenticity part and where it starts. And I have this both with my private coaching clients, but also with everybody who, who, who uh, goes through the idea mindset book is it starts with discovering your strengths. Um, now I work with a particular psychometric tool called the Gallup Clifton Strengths tool, which if you go to the Gallup website, you can, you can do that online. It costs in the UK, it costs 50 pounds. So it's, it's a, mm-hmm. it's, it's not free, but it's not a huge amount of money. Um, mm-hmm. And with all of my coaching clients, whether they're senior leaders or entrepreneurs or artists and performers, I get them all to do their Clifton Strengths. And in the book, I recommend you do that, but you, there's also, if you don't want to pay to do that, there's a sort of simplified version you do in the book. Yeah. And really the philosophy is if you could align your life with things that are your natural talents and strengths, instead of trying to copy other people who are not you, then you'll find your own fulfillment. And I find all the time when I'm working with senior leaders and, and I talk to them and, and say, what's great leadership for you? And they'll say often, Um, here's a person ahead of me or that I've worked for that I look up to and I really respect them and I'm I'm basically trying to copy them. And then I say to them, well, what if they have different strengths from you? What if they're a great communicator, but you're a great strategist? Or what if they're a great analyst, but you're a great diplomat? Well, how would you be a leader at your best? So there's a whole piece about if you can discover your natural talents and strengths and then align what you do to that, then you'll be more fulfilled and more satisfied. And it's a really central tenet of the work that I do. Mm, Yes, I'm a huge fan of Clifton Strengths as well. And just actually going through mine, I found it was really just insightful and revealing. My number one is activator. I'm a make things happen kind of a person. But I realize, I recognize now the negatives of that, that sometimes I can push a bit too much and I just want to get things happening perhaps before all the the thinking is in place. So sometimes I Mm -hmm. have to backtrack and fix up the the, the I's that I didn't dot and T's I didn't cross, but I do make a lot of things happen. So I think that that's so key. And I can still remember actually sitting in an audience many years ago, Gary, when I was a brand new HR manager and I didn't really know what I was doing because I'd only done a few papers on HR when I was at university. And someone talking about how if we can take people's strengths and grow their strengths, that makes them you know, stand out in terms of those areas that's going to be a whole lot better than taking their low points and just bringing them up to average. And mm. that whole philosophy has really stuck with me. So that sounds very aligned to what you're, what you're talking about. Find out what your strengths are and then align what you do to that rather than copying other people. That's absolutely right. So for me, and I use it in my own coaching practice, so my number one strength is something called maximizer, which means if it's good, I'm interested, but really I'm interested if I can make it world-class. So I mean, I'm in the take good things and make them amazing. I'm in that school. And my number 34 out of 34 talent strength is something called restorative, which is fixing things that are broken. Um, and so I realize now better why I'm just not that interested in working with people who can't do what they need to do and they need kind of fixing. I can help them find the right person for them to work with, but it isn't me. And I didn't really understand before why that was, but now I have quite intentionally decided to start working more with people who are good, but want to become. Mm. So now I get energy from it. So, yeah, so. that's amazing. So what are some practical ideas or advice you have for people that are wanting to design their career? Where, where should they start? Well, I think, I think starting with knowing yourself is really, really important. So the first step in the journey in the idea mindset is a process of knowing yourself. And there's three parts to it. 
The first is to understand you at your best, understand your talents and strengths. And you can do an assessment like Clifton Strengths, or you can do uh, other, other ways of just thinking about where am I at my best? Where am I enjoying what I'm doing? So that's, that's part of it. Second part is to get feedback from people that really around you and think about um, how do they perceive me and what do they know about me that I don't necessarily see in myself. So I always get my coaching clients to, to talk to at least three people from different sort of parts of their life to understand them better. Yeah. And then the third part is about understanding your needs. Now, if you say to somebody, what do you need to do? What do you need to change? And they start writing a list. It becomes a very, very long list. And so I say, I get, say to them, write down the long list. And then if you could say, if I could only do one of those things, what's the thing that would make the biggest difference and kind of cascade through to lots of other things. So if you can focus into that one thing, and for some people, they'll say, it's getting control of my work-life balance. For other people, they'll say it's dealing with my anxiety. For someone else, they'll say it's developing a particular skill. Well, then you can focus in and make that happen. But if you have a list of 100 things, then none of them are going to happen. Mm. So focus, I think, is really an important thing. So that's yeah. a great place to start. And then from there, you can go into a journey of thinking about your long-term goals, your short-term steps you're going to get there. I think what makes the idea mindset approach a bit different is that there's a lot of sort of processes and programs that will say, build an action plan. And when you've got an action plan, go and deliver it. Good luck. Off you go. And what I'm doing in the idea mindset, because my own journey had its own ups and downs. And in my own work, I spend a lot of time working with individuals and teams about, well, what trips you up? What does it feel like in the bad times? And how do you get through those dips? That's just as important. There's a reason why when most people have an action plan and you go back six months later and you say, did you do it? They say, oh, not all of it or not much of it. You know, I didn't full, fulfill the year with my new, new year's resolutions or whatever it is. So there's a large part of the program where you start to think about, well, what are the things that could trip me up in this situation? You know, so what if I lost my job? Or what if I didn't get that promotion? Or what if something happened with my relationship? Or what if my, my kids were ill? You know, how would that affect this? And are there some of those things that I might be able to anticipate and put some things in place now to make it less impactful on me? So I could build a stronger network around me. I could build more of a community. I could build a greater relationship with my boss now so that in six months time, when I want to have the conversation about the pay rise, I've already been setting up that conversation for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. And there's another part where you think about the emotional journey of change you start on these journeys, it often feels quite energetic. You're quite excited because you're making a change happen. But actually, we know that before you come through to the kind of sunny uplands of the future, there's generally somewhere a bit of a dip in the middle. We lose mm -hmm. motivation or things go wrong or, you know, it's, it's, it's going slower than you're expecting. And that's frustrating. So starting to think about, well, what would that look like for me? And where am I really in that journey? And what might happen next in the journey I'm going through? And you start to just build a lot more resilience and robustness around making change happen. It's not just a list of tasks to tick off. It's actually a more holistic personal change. Mm, fantastic. And so if somebody is realizing, you know, listening to this, that they're not feeling excited in their work, they're not feeling engaged and loving what they do every day, but they're not quite sure how to transition, or perhaps they know what they would love to do, but there's fear holding them back, or they're just not sure how to make that jump. How would you help people in that situation? Well, a great thing to do in that situation is first to come back to that thought about what do I really love doing? What is the environment in which I'm at my best? Um, when I'm at my best, what kind of people do I have around me? What does my weekly schedule look like? How much free time do I have? Do I get to walk the door in that picture? And then think about where you'd like to be at some point in the future. It could be six months away. It could be two years away. And try to forget about all the things right now that are kind of holding you back and making you feel frustrated and making you feel anxious. Because some of those things will be big, meaty issues, and some of them will feel big and meaty right now. But actually, once you start to see to the future, it starts to change. So I'll tell you a story about one of my first coaches who went on the idea journey. And he actually, he was my first podcast interview. So I can, I'll tell you what he said on the, on the podcast. And he was 
in a dilemma point where he was thinking about, I've got sort of two things that I do in my, in, in my life. He's an actor, but he also managed other people that were actors, like did their sort of daily scheduling management. And, and he was thinking that, um, six, that to be fulfilled and to be happy was to be successful, as in to win awards, to get big roles on stage and whatever. Um, and when he wasn't achieving those goals, he was really frustrated. And so, and he couldn't break out of this sort of cycle of, I want it more, I want to achieve those goals, that's what success looks like, and I'm not getting it, so I'm frustrated. And then I said to him, well, but what's it really about for you? What, what is the thing that you really want that is that environment where you're happy? And then he realized that it wasn't actually the achievement of success. It was creating an environment around him, working with the right kind of people, being with the right kind of And he let go of, I have to be successful on other people's measures of success to be happy. And then he started to make different choices. So he said, more happy and B makes me more money. I'm going to choose A. The consequence of that was really interesting. As he let go of, I need to be more successful to be happy, he became more successful. And the roles that he's in today on stage, are the biggest roles he's ever had in his career. But, but in going through that journey of realizing that happiness is not linked to other people's judgments of success gave him the freedom to go after something that, that did actually turn out to be super successful. Mm, so interesting, isn't it? That, yeah, so much depends on I think what we focus on, isn't it? Mm-hmm. So. And there's a really big part of societal expectations on you. So back to this yeah. society and people around you will have an opinion on what good leadership looks like, what good management looks like, and they'll tell you. And you'll feel that you have to adhere to that model. And I'll say to you, well, what are you good at? And what do you love doing? Because there's lots and lots and lots of different ways of managing and leading and being in a, in, in a, in a corporate role or as an entrepreneur that are all successful but they're all different from one another. And you've just got to find the necessarily the one that anybody around you has as their, as their particular style. And there's a particular stat that I really like from the Clifton Strengths model, where they said, what's the chance of you meeting somebody else that's got the same top five strengths as you? And the answer is on average about one in 250,000. Wow. And so what that means is you're really unique and on average, there's going to be nobody else in the room with anything like the same strengths as you. So they're all giving you, you an opinion. And when you start to think, well, that's, that opinion might be right for me, but it's definitely right for you, which is why you said it. But I'm going to think for myself about what's right for me. Then you start to let go of that need to conform to what other people expect of you. Mm, fantastic. And so what would you say in terms of resilience? How do people build their resilience to keep going when they come up to challenges, come up to obstacles? Well, I think there's two parts to this. So the first part, and this comes from my life as a professional dancer, is mm-hmm. thinking about your mental and physical wellness as a part of your change journey. So I think a lot of people say, I'm going to try and go for promotion next year, and that's going to be a really stressful journey. And as I stress about that journey, my kind of personal life and self-care might take a bit of a back seat, but I'm really going for that promotion. What I'm saying is you've got to prepare yourself physically and mentally to go on that journey. So actually as part of the journey, I get you to do a sleep diary. I get you to do a diet and exercise diary. I get you to set some, some goals. Now, somebody's goals might be to get a six pack. Somebody else's goals might be just to, you know, walk a bit further than they do every day today or to sleep a bit better. And it's entirely up to you. I, I don't have a view at all on what the right answer is for you. But I think it's important that you're thinking of that physical and mental wellness as a part of the whole package. And then the second part is this piece around, think about the kinds of things that trip you up and how you're going to manage them around you to support you on your journey. Think about the way you tell your story to other people to get them to go with you on the journey. So there's a story from our dancing career where we were training every every you know, night of the week and we're going to these regular competitions and in ballroom dancing competition, there are these judges around the side of the floor with a notepad and a pen. And they're basically voting 
giving votes for the couples to go through to the next round. Now, each time we go to the competition, our dancing on average was a little bit better. But the judges were looking at us and saying in, in their minds, well, they know who that couple is and they know how good they are and they know what result they have in the competition. So typically we had to improve for six months before a judge would even notice that our dancing was different. And so I talk about in the book, this idea that if you want somebody to really sit up and make, take notice of something that you're doing differently, you've got to kind of burst into flower. You've got to do something that makes them sit up and take notice. For us, we would change our choreography or uh, my wife would wear a different dress. Then they would start to go, oh, I haven't seen that dress before. Oh, their dancing's better. So what can you do in a, in a work context to uh, indicate to your boss that, you know, now you've been doing your research and you've got more skills, you've got more expertise, you've got to bring it into conversation. You've got to say something in a meeting that you wouldn't normally say. You've got to sit in a different part of the office. You want to do something different, change your backdrop on Zoom to make people notice that you've changed. And if you do that, then people around you supportive and that will help your whole resilience and, and, and change journey. And it's something that I've learned over the years in the business world a lot as well. Um, so. mm. I like that. It's so much about optics, isn't it? It's about not just it what you're doing, but it's actually how you're communicating what you're doing. And I like that specific advice around, you know, little things we could do, change your Zoom background, do something different. Yeah. Get a new plant on your desk. Um, start a so meeting. Another story. Background. I'll tell you a story from a, um, uh, a member of my team years and years and years ago. And she said to me, um, so she was uh, an assistant in the team and I was a manager in the team. And then there were clients that would come in and she said, she said to me one day, why do the clients talk to you and not me? And I said, well, it might be that they're sexist and they're talking to the man. That's possible. Um, but it might be that they don't really recognize that they're not talking to you. They just haven't thought about it, but I'm wearing a suit and you're wearing a jumper. So I said, um, this shouldn't be the right answer, but let's try as a test. Come in tomorrow in a jacket, don't do anything different and see what happens. And she came in the next day in a jacket and the clients immediately started talking to her, which says something about their prejudices, but a little thing that she did differently in a, in a subliminal way made them behave differently and got her what she wanted. Mm. And there'll be lots of little things like that. When I um, got into a particular um, role in the corporate world, um, there was a difference in level where you started wearing a pocket handkerchief and that indicated to people that you were a senior strategic leader as opposed to an operational leader. Yeah. Um, and so I wore the pocket handkerchief, which is not particularly a me thing to do. And suddenly people started talking to me differently. Yeah. And I was like, you're not talking to the handkerchief, but actually they were because mm. it's just part of those little cues that we all have. We don't even know we have them. We don't see them but it does change our behavior. And what it means is you're building a team around you that is, um, that is pushing you along. So it's, it's like getting gravity to work with you, not against you. You know, you're cycling down the hill instead of up the hill. You can get mm. people around you to support you, to help you, to look out for opportunities for you. It makes it that much easier for you to make your change happen. Yeah, absolutely. And and just a story that I think fits that I want to share is we used to have a saying when I worked at the New Zealand College of Fitness where we were training personal trainers and it was be before you are and you will become. And so it was think about the person that you want to be and picture the sorts of things that they will do. How will they present themselves? How will they dress? What will they eat? What will they drink? What attitude will they have? What sort of language will they use? And if you can start to adopt those things and be before you are, then you will become. And one of our lecturers, Holly, she shared how she can remember being a four-year-old watching the Olympics and seeing the gymnasts and saying to her mum, I want to do that one day, mummy. And her mum was like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyhow, she really dedicated herself and she wasn't the most natural gymnast. She wasn't actually, didn't have quite the best build for it, but she would turn up and she would always have the most amazing posture and present herself well and make sure that her hair was absolutely in place. And she wouldn't go and smoke behind the changing sheds like some of her peer group did, even though they hassled her for that. And when it came around for her to be picked for a development squad this one time, 
she was really amazed because she knew that she wasn't necessarily as talented or as physically skilled as others that were potentials, but she actually got picked and the coach came up to her and said, I can see something in you and it's your attitude and it's your desire and it's the way that you're showing up. So I think, yeah, definitely whether we like it or not, the way that we present ourselves has a big influence and that's a really powerful thing to know about, isn't it? So I think so. I think so. I love that story. Mm. So, Gary, I'm sure we could talk all day about this, but I really love your idea mindset. If people wanted to find out more about you, where can they do that? So I'm, I'm online at GaryCrotez.com and you can also find me at Gary Crotez on Instagram. Uh, and then the book is available on Amazon um, in ebook and audio book in New Zealand and hopefully soon in physical book as well when we get the printing. Yeah. And then the podcast that I'm doing is called The Unlock Moment. That's where I've got some of the stories of some of these people that are going through this journey as well. Wonderful. So we'll make sure we have all of the links down below in the show notes. So do head to thrivetvshow.com and you'll be able to get access to all of those notes and obviously encourage you to find out more about the idea mindset, confirming and understanding your identity, the direction you want to take, getting engagement and being excited about what you do and showing up authentically. I love it. So Gary, if there's one final thing you want to share with our listeners and viewers today, what would that be? So I have this little quote in the book that I was thinking about it when we were talking about that sense of focus. And that quote is, um, if you only have time to make one step, then make it a really big one. Mm, I like that. If you only have time to make one step, make it a really big one. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for your time, Gary. It's been such a pleasure to chat with you. Thank you so much for having me on the show. I've loved being here. Thank you. Thanks so much for tuning in. That's been another episode of the Thrive TV show. Go out and thrive. Thank you for listening to the Thrive TV show with Lauren Parsons. Visit thrivetvshow.com to access the show notes and discover our fantastic bonus content. And be sure to subscribe so you don't miss the next inspiring episode.